So again, I have no disclosures. So let's start with the case. This is an 81-year-old woman. So this is definitely an adult with congenital heart disease. No, they're not even in the gray zone here. She came to me with a very difficult to control hypertension. She was on multiple drugs without good control. And she had clear HFPF, a significant dyspnea on exertion, edema. She was pretty miserable. She actually really said, I can't even get out of bed and do much. Now, she did have some arthritic components, which she was sort of blaming for that. She said, when I try to get up and walk, I just feel really weak and my legs really bother me. So she'd become more and more sedentary, which was just a you know a snowball effect so she was unhappy her daughter brought her in and no, nobody was liking where she was in life and so interestingly um, she had had surgical repair of a coarctation at age 13 1950 so very early days of cardiac surgery though we know that coarctation was actually the first congenital defect that uh, we really did a good repair job on early because we're not doing intracardiac repair so she had had that and really hadn't had um, much congenital follow-up so that's going to get to my point that coarctation is one of the congenital defects I worry about most because patients and their families are told uh, that this is a very simple congenital defect. There's this narrowing of the aorta. We just cut it out and stick it together or we put a graft in there and you're cured, cured. Okay. So here's her physical exam. Um, she had a differential in her arm blood pressure. I don't have a good leg blood pressure to tell you, but I can tell you there was a radiofemoral delay. So I felt like there was some um, change uh, in flow to the legs, but she had a 40 millimeter of mercury difference to her left arm. And that was related to how her subclavian was um, affected by her repair. But you can see that she had pretty significant systolic hypertension with very stiff vessels. Um, we had a really wide pulse pressure here. She had an, she amazingly was in sinus at the time of my exam, and she had an S4 present, and she had a fairly loud murmur in the left upper chest that radiated to her back. Her lungs were clear at the moment, and she had some edema on the exam. And this was her echo. The echo pictures are not gorgeous for those of you in the echo lab, but I'm up at the arch and I'm just putting a continuous wave Doppler through. And she's got a fairly high velocity uh, going through the descending thoracic aorta. It's about three meters per second. And abdominal aortic Doppler, which is key in the echo lab when you're evaluating a patient with coarctation, it's not classic, but this upstroke is a bit slurred. It should be really straight up and down. We don't see a lot of diastolic forward flow, which is the hallmark you're looking for on a board exam is where you see this sort of sawtooth pattern slur like this, but this is not completely normal. So I'm thinking that maybe her coarctation is still pretty significant or has a recurrent coarctation. So her max gradient was 37, that slow upstroke. Her LV ejection fraction was preserved, but again, she has diastolic dysfunction and we could see that with all of our echo indicators of filling pressure. She has secondary um, pulmonary hypertension hypertension from her HFPEF, RV systolic pressure 57, and her aortic valve was tricuspid. So, you know, she had about a 50% chance or more of having a bicuspid aortic valve, but she did not, and the valve was actually still functioning well. This was her CT. So we got a CT scan, some axial imaging to look at her aorta. I just wanted to show you how tortuous this thing is. She's got this kind of infolding here. It's relatively narrow. And from this one view, you might say, well, you don't know for sure how narrow this truly is. You're picking one two-dimensional slice, and, and maybe uh, this isn't the smallest uh, amount, but we did do some 3D reconstruction. She had intercostal collateral arteries, which was a sign of still significant hemodynamic coarctation. And when we really looked at this 3D rendering, you see how tortuous again here, there was greater than 50% narrowing of the aorta. So she had severe recurrent coarctation, I thought, and she had symptoms. She was very hypertensive, poorly controlled. She had had some trouble with um, getting a bump in her creatinine when we were trying to like be more aggressive with her control. And she had, was just kind of miserable with her HFPEF. So 
this is not an easy situation. This is an 81 year old. There is no guideline that tells me what to do for an octogenarian with a recurrent coarctation and, and can't find a thousand person trial to see what the outcomes are. But I did think we should investigate her and individualize her medicine. And so we took her to Kath just to make sure we weren't being fooled by echo gradients can be off. I mean, I thought we were right and the CT was good. She had a pretty high peak to peak gradient measured by cath, 47 millimeters of mercury. So when we think about treating half path or even half ref, what do we want to do? We want to afterload reduce. We want to improve their blood pressure. You can't get much more better afterload reduction with the medicine if, than relieving 47 millimeters of mercury gradient. Thankfully, she didn't have much coronary artery disease, and like I said, her aortic valve was fine. So what do you recommend to do? She's failing medical therapy. She's miserable. So I talked to her and her family at great length with, of course, input from my interventional team. We, we kind of have a team-based approach to this, and we talked to them about an attempt at stinting this coarctation, explaining to them the risk, the potential benefit, and the limitation in our knowledge, especially in this group. So she decided to go for it, and here we are. I just thought you'd like this. Look at how waste, how much of a waste there is. So you can tell, and so this, um, I'm gonna need to go back with a high pressure balloon here, but definitely there was a significant uh, narrowing. And then so we come back with a high pressure balloon, another angle here, you're gonna see that waste sort of pop out. And I think it looks like a pretty good result. Um, both visually, and then we actually got a really good result hemodynamically. So I have a little typo here. It was not an eight centimeter wide stent, sorry, 18 millimeter by six centimeter covered stent. Uh, we post dilated with a 25 millimeter balloon, uh, and the post stent gradient peak to peak was zero. So I was kind of hopeful we had done some good for this lady. Certainly we had taken on some risk of harm in this octogenarian, but we wanted to see if we could improve her. And interestingly, in the hospitalization um, period, we just kept her overnight, uh, got this CT scan and things looked good. And she had what we see even in our younger patients, she started having this interesting diuresis um, post. She had sort of some fluctuations in her blood pressure, which we see in our younger patient population. And we were able over a uh, course of close follow-up after hospitalization to get her off of all of her blood pressure meds, but one. And this is how she came back to me. This is her right arm blood pressure was 128 over 80. I'm not saying this is a typical outcome, like this is like a mutual fund commercial or something. This is not a predictive of all outcomes because, you know, her vessels are stiff, but she had a huge gradient and we did get rid of that. And she was able to have, she had an improvement in her creatinine. We had her off of uh, all drugs but one. And what was most gratifying is she already said at four months, I was really improved, she really improved with her shortness of breath. And she was getting around more because this, arthritis pain in her legs had gotten better. And so I think she was really just um, feeling better, getting sort of better uh, perfusion. I've seen her now, we're now 18 months out and she is getting more and more vigorous. So we're now 83 years old and she's walking now and her quality of life has markedly improved. So I thought this was a good um, case to just show you that Things sometimes don't present like the textbook, and we're not always talking about 18-year-olds when we're looking at this. And just to bring back the point, this is a, one of the Mayo illustrations that we use in a, in a little booklet that we give our patients, and we're kind of bad about this too. We act like this is this simple thing. We, we point to the coarctation like, well, this is the problem. And remember, of course, this is a field effect. This is a problem in the structure uh, and formation of the heart that affects all of the cells that came from the neural crust. And so the ascending aorta has changed in its media. It's different. The bicuspid, the aortic valve is different. Even if it's tricuspid, it may have increased risk of calcification. Your coronary arteries are different. Your intracranial arteries are different. And this is just the final common pathway or manifestation of the embryologic change. And so, so I think we need to recognize that coarctation is a systemic illness, uh, a systemic condition that has a lot of effects that we need to be cognizant of. And these patients need lifelong follow-up because we do have a lot of issues after coarctation. And unfortunately, many of them are silent till they're a disaster. And so we do have like this patient recurrent coarctation. 
Certainly, if you do an end-to-end -end repair when the patient is small, remember that suture line, that's not going to grow well. So whatever size the surgeon sutures there, that's going to stay. Certainly, if it's an interposition graft, the graft doesn't grow. And so you've got whatever fixed size you had at the time of repair. If you do a, a more complicated repair, like a subclavian flap, where the surgeon might take some of your vascular tissue from your left subclavian to augment the aorta, that can have aneurysm formation. That's a high risk uh, of aneurysm in that area. But we also have other aneurysm formation that we're worried about in these patients, specifically ascending aorta dilatation. And these are the patients, we talk a lot about the bicuspid valves because it's just such a higher, bigger population. But the patient with coarctation bicuspid valve is at markedly increased risk for dissection and rupture of their aorta compared to just the bicuspid valve patient alone. So we need to be thoughtful of that in terms of how we time our follow-up. All of these patients are at risk for systemic hypertension even if they don't get a recurrence because their vessels are a bit stiff. So we need to be on that and treating patients appropriately to guidelines to help them avoid complications of hypertension, including HEFPEF. Um, early coronary disease reported in all the studies of patients with coarctation, and part of it may be that we're giving them another risk factor with hypertension, but the coronaries are probably abnormal. So we need to have a lot of um, emphasis on other risk modification to avoid coronary artery disease. And then cerebrovascular aneurysms have been shown to be at increased frequency in patients with coarctation. It's a little unclear that they need anything done about them, and the guidelines I'll show you have softened on what we do about that. So here's what we would say for a patient that you might show up in your clinic, previous co they say they're feeling well, what should we do to follow them appropriately so we don't get to 81 years of age with HEFPEF? Well, these patients do need echo, and it's either between one to three years. I don't say they all need annual echoes, but if they have a bicuspid valve that's not functioning well, they might need annual or even less than annual echoes. So you're looking at their aortic valve, you're trying to evaluate their ascending aorta for enlargement, you're looking back at that abdominal Doppler, which might be your best first clue that something's wrong upstream before you get any axial imaging. I do think anyone that's had a repair needs some type of CT or MR scanning every three to five years, depending on what you're following and what you're looking at. I think if this is a patient with a subclavian flap and you're really worried about an aneurysm or it already looks aneurysmal, you might tighten that up. If it's a patient who looks beautiful and there are 25 on their first study, you probably don't need to radiate them every year. You might go five years without looking again. So you've got to individualize this. I still do look at the endocranial vessels once. The guidelines now have softened this to a 2B indication because while we're finding these small aneurysms, it's not clear that they progress or need intervention, but I think it's reasonable to look one time. In terms of assessing blood pressure control, of course you want to be looking in the office both arms. It is good to get a leg measurement as well. Sometimes though you need to find out what they're doing when they're active. So if you have a young patient who's being very active, I'll put them on the treadmill and just make sure they're not getting some really exaggerated blood pressure response to exercise. Uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring might be helpful in certain circumstances. And then all of these young patients need, uh, she's not young, but all of our patients with coarctation need a lipid evaluation evaluation and um, a good discussion about their risk factor modification for coronary disease. So hope that was a, an interesting case. And for the last few minutes, I'm going to utilize this case to uh, convey some, not only some information to, to, spring, to springboard to tomorrow's discussion. So here's a 20-year-old woman. She has no prior medical history. She came uh, to attention at 14 weeks. She went uh, in with a URI, and she had a fairly loud murmur, and an echo was obtained because of this uh, exam finding. And so here is a parasternal short axis image. And for those of you who don't read echo, uh, this is abnormal. This is the atrial septum, and there's a very large defect there. And then she had a apical four-chamber view. This is congenital format. Apex is down. This is the right atrium, right ventricle. There's a very big defect with a big 
Shan. So this is a Secundum ASD. She's 14 weeks pregnant. She's been previously asymptomatic. She only came in because she had a cold. So she has a fairly large ASD, normal RV estimated pressure, uh, dilated RV, but the function is preserved and she has no symptoms. So what do you want to do? First, we got to think and talk with her about the risks of this um, condition, not just now, but in the future. What's the risk during pregnancy? How do we follow her and how do we deliver her? And I'll often get questions similar to this, like, do we have to put her on an anticoagulant? I mean, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state and she's going to have a big stroke. Uh, does she need a C-section delivery? God forbid, does she need termination? And the answer is certainly no to that from a cardiac standpoint. So people are rightly concerned that if you have this volume lo lesion, an ASD, and you're now volume loading with pregnancy, that you might get right heart failure. It's a volume load, and her right heart was already functioning normally, so it's unlikely that at this young age, even with the excess volume of pregnancy, that she's going to have overt, profound right heart failure. She may get more edema, but I think that we have to kind of keep that risk in um, a reasonable assessment. What about her risk of arrhythmia? She's already got a big right atrium. Now we're stretching her right atrium more with more volume. Maybe she's at higher risk of AFib, and we'll see if that's the case. Paradox limbless gets everybody's attention. Everybody wants to put these ladies on Lovenox. And so we have to think about what's the risk of that. And then fetal congenital heart disease. What often doesn't get raised in these potential concerns, and we'll see, is what's the risk of neonatal complication from even simple congenital heart disease? We often think of it as kind of an all or nothing. Can you have a pregnancy? What's mom's risk? What's the risk of fetal congenital disease? But not what's the risk of things like preeclampsia, early delivery, being small for gestational age, all of the things that can affect the fetus. So this was my management strategy for this patient, and we'll go over some of my rationale. Of course, she needs continued routine OB follow-up with close monitoring of fetal growth. I would anticipate a vaginal delivery, and that's true for almost every woman with congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease. They do better with vaginal delivery. It's actually a less stressful, and long-term, you do better. I would put an air filter on any IV that she had at the time of delivery. She's going to be doing a lot of Valsalva. I don't want a big bunch of air bubbles going in and having her get a paradoxical air embolus. But I did not think her risk of embolic phenomenon was enough to put her on anticoagulation. Now, the data is mixed in some ways on this, but I'm going to show you some reassuring data that will let you feel comfortable to not put patients who have no other risk factors for thrombotic disease on anticoagulation. Um, remember, there is a downside. It's no free lunch. You put her on anticoagulation, she has an increased risk of hemorrhage around um, the, the placenta and then other bleeding complications. I recommended that she have periodic cardiac evaluation, and I saw her several times during pregnancy. We got a fetal echo at 20 weeks, so you could argue that picking up an ASD is going to be hard because every fetus has a PFO. And then I did not recommend closure, of course, at this time, but told her that when she was stable postpartum hemodynamically, at some point we could come back and close this ASD. Her outcome was good, which thankfully is the outcome for most of our moms, even with unrepaired congenital heart disease. She had a healthy baby boy at term, no complications, and four months postpartum, we were actually able to device close this, even though it was large. So let's look at some of the data. I mean, we're not always operating in a vacuum, though sometimes in congenital heart disease we feel like we are. We're just taking individual cases and looking at them. This is a really nice study out of uh, Europe, a very big database looking at women with atrial septal defects. We're thinking about simple, quote, congenital heart disease. We often talk so much in pregnancy about valvular heart disease and more complicated. We don't often think about what's the impact of these quote, simple lesions like ASD. Well, arrhythmias actually were increased in both women who had an unrepaired ASD at the time of pregnancy or previous ASD repair, but they weren't super high. Less than 5% of pregnancies were complicated, but it was certainly more than the population of the control group. A decline in New York Heart Association class did occur, so this fear that I'm going to volume load this right heart further and make you have a uh, change in symptoms, but it was still pretty low, about 3% of pregnancies only. Syncope was uh, there and rare, and TIA was actually really rare, and it did not reach any statistical threshold of concern, so there was not a, 
a p-value of significance compared to the general population. So some reassurance that maybe we don't have to be putting people on high-dose anticoagulation. What about obstetrical and neonatal complications? Going back to that idea we talk about mom, but what about baby? There's an interesting signal here that I want you to think about through all of uh, congenital heart disease and pregnancy. Preeclampsia is increased in women with heart defects. And this just goes kind of to the nature of the fact that preeclampsia is a marker of cardiovascular fitness and health. And so if there are some changes, I think that you're at risk. So even the ASD moms, repaired or unrepaired, had an increased risk of preeclampsia eclampsia. The p-value was significant for unrepaired ASDs compared to the general population. Fetal mortality was about the same. Actually, it did not come out to be statistically significant, but it was important that if you had an unrepaired ASD, your risk of having a small for gestational age infant was higher. So that just shows you that maybe any time we put a change in the system where we're not able to deliver effective cardiac output, even with something simple like an ASD, we could have an impact. So what were the factors in this group overall associated with adverse outcomes, things we should consider with our patients when telling them about risk? Well, interestingly, in this group, history of arrhythmia was relevant in maternal age was relevant. This is similar to what we're seeing in other risk stratifiers and other um, models to help us talk about risk, but arrhythmia remains an important risk stratifier. Obstetrical complication really was maternal age. So maybe if you have a mom who's older, you'll be thinking more about her risk of uh, other issues and be thinking also about her risk of um, uh, arrhythmia and 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 TIA, things like that. So I think we've got to take age into account, not just what your anatomy is. And then unrepaired ASD was important for neonatal events. So in the last uh, minute here or two, let's look at other, quote, simple. I don't think any congenital heart defect is simple, but what about VSDs? VSDs are a different animal than ASD, right? So we're usually going to see moms who come to childbearing with a big VSD that was repaired in childhood, or a small VSD that we don't think is hemodynamically significant. We're not going to be looking at women who have Isominger physiology, so big unrepaired VSDs with hemodynamic significance. That's not part of this cohort. Um, and so these are this interesting group. Arrhythmias, a 1%, 2.3% repaired. So you did worse in this group if you were repaired. Why is that? Well, your VSD was probably bigger. If you're unrepaired as an adult and you're being followed in a pregnancy clinic, you probably have what's considered a hemodynamically insignificant VSD. You have a VSD patch that can put you at increased risk of arrhythmia. Endocarditis was very rare, only one episode in the whole group. Here's our signal for preeclampsia again, this idea of cardiovascular disease uh, influencing um, pregnancy in the vascular space. Uh, unrepaired versus the general population was significant. Um, preterm labor, small for gestational age. Again, repaired VSD patients did worse. And that's, again, because they probably had more significant cardiovascular impact early on and changes in cardiovascular behavior. Uh, recurrence of CHD, about 2%. We're seeing that in most of our uh, single simple defects. That, that's 2 to 3% risk. So how about coarctation? We go back to our, our lady. She actually did have children with no complications, interestingly. But these women do have increased risk of complications, including preterm delivery. There's our preeclampsia signal higher than the general population. But what we're more concerned potentially about is serious complications like dissection. In this Mayo Clinic study, the only dissection was in a mother with Turner's syndrome, so we do know that those women are at higher risk. And you can say, how did a Turner's get pregnant? Well, we have assisted reproductive technologies, and these women are having pregnancies now, and we need to talk to them about the risk of aortic complication. Um, hypertension, though, is real and significant, whether you're repaired or unrepaired. Uh, so those stiff vessels, that's a big deal. So in conclusion, uh, and holding you hopefully not too far back from skiing, most women with what we consider the simple septal defects or simple congenital heart defects can have a successful pregnancy, both from a maternal and a fetal perspective, but there are increased 
maternal and fetal risks that we need to be aware about and counsel appropriately. We don't want to overblow these risks. They're not super high, but we do want to follow these moms. And all of these women, even if you think this is not a big deal or a paired ASD, they probably deserve um, a consultation with someone who is in tune with a maternal cardiology so that they can give them uh, the best pre-pregnancy counseling and advice. Thanks for your attention.